May I ask those still to leave the chamber to do so quietly, please? The next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 5946 in the name of Neil Finlay on leading journalists criticise the Scottish Government over freedom of information requests. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons. I call on Neil Finlay to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Finlay. Thanks very much, President Officer, and I'd like to thank members of my own party, the Greens, Liberal, Demo uh, Liberal Democrats, Tory party, for signing this motion. Sadly, no member of the SNP uh, managed to sign it. The Freedom <coughs> of Information Act, uh, introduced by the Labour government, aimed to provide the public with the right to access information that is held by the state about what is being done in their name. In a recent Ipsos Mori poll uh, in 2017 showed 94% of people agreed it is important for the public to be able to access such information. The right to access, has, access information has three distinct elements. It empowers people to make an, informed, uh, make an information request and receive the information quickly. It permits people to see what is disclosed and when, and importantly, the ability to enforce that right. When I came into this place, I naively expected parliamentary questions to be the vehicle I would use to find out information. How? <laughs> wrong I was. The quality of replies we often get back is I can only describe as dross. They demean this parliament and many at a cost of £12 each to the public purse to process would be as well going in the shredder. So for many of us the remedy is the Freedom of Information Act, a process that costs yet more public money and time and not insignificant effort. And like the answers to parliamentary questions we increasingly find that FO I request elicit little or no information. And of course, it's not just members of this parliament or the public who use FOI as a means to try and break through the secrecy of government and public bodies. Journalists use it too. And just two weeks ago, 23 prominent journalists signed an open letter to this parliament raising very serious concerns about how FOI is being mishandled, deliberately mishandled in my view. They highlighted delays beyond the 20-day period for answers, how emails asking for an update on answering requests in cases of delays are routinely ignored by officials, officials delaying responses for so long that the initial requests only get answered under internal, internal review, making it impossible for journalists to ask for inc incomplete replies to be internally reviewed again, resulting in longer delays as they have to go to the Information Commissioner. Government officials taking control of requests to other government agencies without the consent of the applicant. Requests being blocked or refused for 10 years reasons. Requests being screened for political damage by special advisors and of, of responses to individual journalists being routinely handled by specialist advisors. And much, much more. These complaints have been made by respected journalists including Rob Edwards, Severin Carroll, Dan, Dan Sanderson, <coughs> Andrew Pickin, Bernard Ponsonby, David Clegg, Michael Blackley, Paul Hutchin, Tom Gordon, Kieran Andrews, Simon Johnson and others. It is incredible that such a diverse list of experienced journalists felt they had no option but to do this. And I particularly want to thank the Ferret and Common Space for their excellent work on this, issues. this issue. Con curtailing a free press, the refusal to release information and a culture of secrecy are the tactics deployed by despots and dictators, not a government that boasts it is one of the 15 pioneer members of the Open, government's, uh, open Government Partnership's international sub-national government programme. My office uses FOI regularly to try and hold those in, to, in power to account. Time and again, the government routinely blocks or redacts the release of information. We're regularly told that meetings listed in ministerial diaries have no agenda, no minutes or notes taken because no substantive government business was discussed. Let me give you a few examples. January the 21st, 2016, the First Minister and senior civil servant Lisa Bird met with financier Peter de Vink at the new club Edinburgh, described as Scotland's oldest and preeminent private members club, featuring fine dining, entertainment and a socially vibrant atmosphere. I couldn't comment, I've never been. No agenda, no minutes were taken. 26th of September again, the new club, popular place apparently. Uh, John Swinney and Fiona Robertson, Director of Learning Scottish Government, 
met businessman Angus Tullock. No agenda, no minutes. 2nd of November 2016, Derek Mackay and a senior civil servant met Barry White and Peter Rickey of the Scottish Futures Trust. No agenda, no minutes. 9th of November 2016, Hamza Youssef met Phil Vester, then ScotRail. No agenda, no minutes. You know the routine. 29th of October 2016, John Swinney met with Sally Loudon, Chief Executive of COSLA. No agenda, no minutes. 25th of February 2016, John Swinney met with senior INEOS officials. No agenda, no minutes. 7th of September 2016, Nicola Sturgeon met with Alan Muir, editor of the Scottish Sun. No agenda, no minutes. And 15th of March 2015, Nicola Sturgeon met with Andrew Wilson of Charlotte Street Partners. You've guessed it, no agenda, no minutes. Are we seriously supposed to believe that ministers met with the Chief Executive of ScotRail, with any of us who want to frack half of Scotland, COSLA, directors of the Scottish Futures Trust, the editor of one of the country's biggest selling newspapers, a senior lobbyist and a chair of the SNP's Growth Commission, and no substantive government business was discussed. President Officer, the government seems to think we all zip up the back. Only yesterday, only yesterday, I received a very late response in relation to the Transvaginal Mesh Review. The reply is remarkable. At the Public Petitions Committee meeting on Mesh, the Cabinet Secretary said that on this issue, and I quote, there were a great number of FOI requests that involve a lot of information. I reassure Mr Finlay that we will respond to his FOI request as quick as possible. His office has requested a great deal of information which it will take time to gather. However, the response will be issued as quickly as possible. Yesterday, only nine emails or letters was, was, were released. Is this the lot of information the Cabinet Secretary promised? But it gets worse. We were denied all other information because they claim that the review set up by the Scottish Government was independent and as such doesn't fall under FOI, even though the Government provided the Secretariat to the group and they have admitted that they hold all minutes and all correspondence. What a farce. And let me add a few things I have received just today. A meeting between John Swinney and EIS FILA on the 14th of May regarding the college's dispute. No agenda, no minutes. 16th of September 2016, Keith Brown meeting businessmen to discuss Chinese investment in Scotland. No agenda, no minutes. This is farcical. It's not just the Scottish Government that is at fault. We find other public bodies using similar tactics. I am today calling on this parliament to take these matters very seriously indeed. Scotland is not a pioneer in open, open government. It's a country where there is a systematic avoidance of scrutiny and accountability from the highest level down. And I'm calling on the Standards and Procedures Committee to hold an inquiry into the claims made by the 23 journalists. And there must be a whole-scale review of the way the government operates FOI. We cannot allow the current practice to continue. Move on to the open debate. <clears throat> Can I have speeches of no more than four minutes, please? And that's Graham Simpson to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you. Can I start by thanking uh, Neil Finlay, not something I'm in the habit of doing, um, for bringing this matter to Parliament and for his excellent speech. We should also, of course, thank the 23 journalists who wrote their open letter highlighting their concerns over the handling of FOIs. I note that their employers range from the BBC, STV, the Daily Record, Daily Mail, and even the Sunday Herald, not known for criticizing the Scottish Government, but I was disappointed not to see any signatory from my former employers, the Scottish Sun. Um, I hope their omission is because they weren't asked and not that they refused. Serious issues have been raised by the journalists. It's essential in a democracy that authorities are open and transparent. And the purpose of the Freedom of Information Act is to ensure that they are. But when you have people running government, councils, whatever, who are by their nature centralizing and mistrusting of the public, then they'll try to find, find ways around the law. And that's what I think has been going on and the journalists have shone a light on the practice. The former Scottish Information Commissioner, 
Rosemary Agnew said as much when she described the behavior of ministers on freedom of information as totally unacceptable and rude. The Scottish Government says it is outward looking, more open and accessible to Scotland's people than ever before. They promise to be a beacon of transparency. These words are easy to say, but less easy to back up because the evidence shows the opposite. You can't help thinking that the response to tricky questions is not tell them what they want to know, but what shall we tell them? If your instinct is to keep things hidden, then your response to potentially embarrassing requests could be to say that records aren't kept or that minutes weren't taken. Failing that, then stalling tactics are employed, presumably to frustrate the person requesting the information in the hope that they'll give up and go away. Let's look at some of the things the journalist letter alleges. Information requests being delayed beyond the deadline, emails asking for updates ignored, endless delays leading to complaints to the commissioner, requests being blocked or refused for tenuous reasons, and requests being screened for political damage by special advisers. I think we've had quite enough of special advisers, thank you. Uh, if I'm allowed time, no extra time, sorry, I can't. I've heard Joe Fitzpatrick's meandering and vague answers in Parliament on this, and they don't wash. Let's hope we get more sense today. As I said, I used to be a journalist. The press has its faults, but a free press and an open government are essential to our democracy. There should always be a tension between the press and government. Government will always have things they don't want people to know about, and it's the job of journalists to find out these things. But remember the farce we had when the SNP said it had taken legal advice on an independent Scotland's place in the EU? It spent thousands of taxpayers of money to stop us discovering that it had no such advice. No wonder Rosemary Agnew formed the view she did. The Scottish Government needs to change its ways. Yes, there are times when you need to have private discussions so that you can talk about things openly. Try telling that to the First Minister. But freedom of information is not there to be got round. And that is what has been happening. Monica Lennon to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to pay tribute to my colleague Neil Findlay, MSP, for bringing this important matter to Parliament this evening. Freedom of information legislation is based on the simple democratic principle that the public have a right to know about the decisions and actions taken in their name by the people they elect and pay for. Journalists, as we know, have used FOI to great effect, sometimes with devastating consequences for governments or individual politicians. And individuals and community groups every day also use FOI to find out important information on issues that matter to them. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are told that requesting information from a Scottish public authority is simple. All you have to do is ask. You don't even have to live in Scotland and you don't have to mention FOI either. Likewise, you don't have to give any reasons for asking or say why you want the information. This comes from the Scottish Information Commissioner booklet, Your Right to Know, and it includes tips on how to ask for information. You can ask for any recorded information the authority holds at the time of your request. Types of information that the authority might hold that are of interest to the public include, for example, internal correspondence, reports and minutes of meetings. The booklet also says it may be helpful to add your phone number or other contact information. If you're happy for the authority or the government to contact you, it may help to speed the inquiry up. So if it's so simple to ask the questions, why is it so difficult to get the answers? The Scottish Government is under attack tonight with this motion. Um, so in some respects, I'm not surprised that SNP uh, members have signed. But when you listen to the, 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 rest, the, the list of um, appalling sins that have been read out by Neil Findlay tonight, it's really in the interest of all of us in this chamber, on behalf of all of our constituents, to take this matter seriously. Yep. Now, many government ministers, including the First Minister, were, were named in that list read out by Neil Findlay. And I saw Fergus Ewing sitting at the back, maybe just to check that he wasn't getting a mention, and I see he's, he's no longer here. 
But when 23 prominent Scottish journalists have felt the need to so clearly what they see as shortcomings of how Freedom of Information Scotland Act is being interpreted and implemented by the Scottish Government and officials, it is clear that something has gone very far wrong. The principles of open and transparent government, much flaunted by the current administration, is in stark contrast with the vast majority of the evidence of those who use FOI legislation to obtain information. Graeme Simpson has alluded to some of the problems that Rosemary Agnew outlined, the former Scottish Information Commissioner, um, describing the behaviour of Scottish ministers as rude and totally unacceptable and being unnecessarily pedantic. It doesn't read well. Severin Carell from The Guardian, um, in one of his uh, comments ahead of this debate, has outlined that the Scottish Government abruptly stopped publishing FY request responses on its disclosure log on the government's own website. This only makes it harder for the public and professionals to keep track of those responses. But the government kept the, the, intro, uh, the introductory log on the website saying that its policy is that where we release information in response to an FOI request, we recognise it will be usually of interest to the wider public in addition to the original applicant. Well, why take all the information away? Earlier this year, I asked the Scottish Government for a record of any meetings that officials and ministers had with organisations to discuss the provision of sanitary products in relation to uh, a campaign that I've been involved in on period poverty. Like Neil Findlay, as a new member, I thought asking straightforward parliamentary questions would be the route to get a lot of this information. But again, I got an answer that had been cleared by SPADs and exemptions had been applied and I'm still really none the wiser. Likewise, on colleges, um, I asked for information on John Sturrock QC, who's been appointed as a mediator to the disastrous negotiations around national bargains, bargaining. And uh, I got a ridiculous response to a parliamentary question. So hopefully when I get some FY replies in the next couple of weeks, the Deputy Presiding Officer, we will get further information. But I just want to end on this point. There's a huge concern in the public about the prevalence of fake news. So it's critical that the public has information that we can trust and we know the provenance of. My 10-year-old daughter and her classmates recently had a lesson on how to spot fake news. Um, it would be interesting to give them a list of FOI responses and ask them what they make of that. Thank you. Andy Whiteman, followed by Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Neil Finlay for uh, bringing this debate. Um, I also want to thank the journalists uh, who wrote the letter on the 1st of June highlighting concerns about the operation of freedom of information legislation, particularly in respect to requests made of the Scottish Government, which comes on the back of criticisms uh, of the Scottish Government by the outgoing Freedom of Information uh, Commissioner, uh, which have already been quoted, uh, where she has talked about the Government being unnecessarily uh, pedantic, um, and where it has a poor approach to freedom of information uh, law. And on the face of it, journalists do appear to be being treated uh, differently, yet they play a vital role in holding power to account. Now, beyond this particular debate, I would ask the Minister if he will be providing a full response to the journalists who wrote the letter to, I think it was, Cabinet Secretary Derek uh, Mackay. It's clear to me that we need proper post-legislative scrutiny of the 2002 Act. If for no other reason than an important part of the regime, the Environmental Information Scotland regulations, is an EU directive which will be affected by uh, the UK leaving uh, the EU. But I just want to use these, my three minutes to highlight three improvements to FOI legislation. The first is the question of an internal review, and Neil Finlay alluded uh, to this. The failure to report, respond to requests on time has led to the internal review process being used to address this failure and being then unavailable to be used to challenge an unsatisfactory uh, response, leaving only a full appeal to the Commissioner. Now, the law could be tightened by providing two distinct internal pr review procedures, one for failure to uh, respond timiously or other administrative uh, errors, and one on the substantive question of whether the information, in fact, has been uh, released. Um, the second question is the question of logs, which uh, Monica Lennon uh, mentioned. It strikes me as odd that public authorities can, in response to freedom of information requests, release voluminous material uh, to those seeking it, but there's no statutory obligation on them to tell anybody else that such information has been released. Now, the means to do this is by a log of requests and responses published by public authorities. Now, the Scottish Government and other authorities have done this, 
paying, uh, particularly in relation to, to, to high profile cases, for example, the release of uh, McGrathy, uh, the decision to approve planning consent for Mr. Trump's golf course, uh, in the case of the City of Edinburgh Council, information relating to tenement repairs uh, scandal. Um, but if freedom of information is to re realise its full potential, then all releases should be, as a matter of course, be published on the log. So it was something of a shock to read Severin Carell's testimony uh, that the Scottish Government has published no logs since December 2015. And if the Minister could address this point in his closing remarks, that would be useful as well. Finally, in the question of copyright, um, five years ago I saw information about a Swiss banker called Han Henry Angest chairman and chief executive of Arbuthnot Banking Group and a former master of the Worshipful Company of International Bankers. Mr Angus provided almost £7 million to the Conservative Party. It was a funder of Atlantic Bridge, the charity that funded Adam Werity's excursions around the world with Liam Fox. Mr Angus has also provided substantial funds to the Conservative Party in Scotland, including Murdo Fraser's failed leadership campaign for the Tory leadership, and he owns an estate in Perthshire owned by a company in Jersey. Now, in 2005, Mr. Angus began providing funding to Perth College to finance research on private land ownership in Scotland. So I asked Perth College about this money and Mr. Angus's relationship with them. The response I received, it was clear that he was, amongst other things, angling for an honorary degree in return for his financial support. But Perth College told me that copyright in the information they were releasing belonged to Perth College and that its consent was required for me to publish the information I, I received. I asked them for this consent, but they refused. And so to this day, I cannot publish the information I received five years ago for others to examine. Anyone wanting this information, of course, is perfectly free to make a separate request to Perth College. Presiding officer, if information is released under FOI, there should be a statutory right to distribute information provided to anybody else. And in conclusion, the FOI regime needs serious scrutiny. It's performed well, as have the two commissioners to date, but the performance of some public authorities leaves much to be desired. The Scottish Government in particular has questions to answer. The public are entitled to answer to the questions raised by journalists, and I hope ministers provide them soon. Tavish Scott to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Neil Finlay is quite right. The, this Parliament should do no less than initiate a full inquiry into the freedom of information's effectiveness, the culture and institutional behaviour of government at all levels, and the behaviour particularly of ministers, special advisers and civil servants. Uh, and the kind and the, the one point from the uh, litany of worries that were expressed by journalists in the letter uh, that has been cited much in this debate already that strikes me as the most important one is where those journalists write, this raises the question of whether Scottish ministers and civil servants now have a practice of not recording information that would previously have been recorded. Give away to Neil Finn. Um, isn't it the ultimate irony that in the application... Excuse me, can you wait until I say your name for oh, the sorry. official report? Very Thank sorry. you. Um, I wouldn't like them to think it was somebody else that was speaking. <laughs> Neil Finlay. Thank you. Isn't it the ultimate irony that in the application uh, to the Open Government uh, Partnership Strategy Group, written by John Swinney, he says at the very end, at the end of the pilot, we would happy to, we'd be very happy to mentor another government. <laughs> Tavish Scott. Well, irony be one way of putting it. Some other, other unparliamentary language be, would be a, another way. But what uh, concerns me most is that kind of institutional behaviour that has been cited uh, much. That was never the intention uh, of the passing of this legislation in 2002. And I uh, did that thing that some of us do from time to time and dug out the old debate from all those years back, Deputy Presiding Officer. And you will remember it well because you are in here voting uh, in that, on that matter as well. And the Deputy First Minister who introduced the legislation said in the stage one debate... Uh, about the independence of the Commissioner, which Graham, uh, uh, members uh, across the Chamber have already mentioned, um, and the importance of that. Uh, Jim Wallace said the Commissioner's independence will ensure the integrity and credibility of the regime. Uh, he went on to say it should not be the case of their saying, how can we withhold this? Do any of the exemptions apply? Instead, the Commissioner will ensure that the default setting is disclosure. And now we find, now we find in repeat examples, cited in the letter, cited in many other places as well, that that is exactly what has been going on. The behaviour has become institutional. And when uh, members cite the example of the previous Commissioner describing the current government as rude and totally unacceptable, then some ministers should have the 
integrity to recognise that for what it is, a damning indictment of what is currently going on and the need for a fundamental change. And that's why Neil Finlay is right to argue for a full, independent inquiry into what is going on and why it is currently not working as assuredly it is not. One final point on culture, because this all comes down to culture, the culture of behaviour and the fact that that is now not as it should be. Two very good uh, points were made by, in that 2002 debate, presiding officer, one by my good friend Bruce Crawford, who said, and I quote, there is no doubt that without changing the culture of secrecy, there can be no change. He went on, but that was a striking and correct observation about the principle of cultural change. And also, and then by Christine Graham, who was very uh, outspoken on this matter, as she used to be when she was in opposition, I want to address the culture of openness which is at the heart of the bill. Those of us who are at Parliament have found it hard to detect the fresh breeze of openness blowing through the Parliament's corridors. She went on to make some points about parliamentary uh, questions, but I'll not bore the Chamber with that right at this uh, particular moment. There is a lot to be uh, done in this measure, uh, and that culture needs to change. And no better than to quote a current minister uh, of the current government who made a very fair observation, I thought, in that debate, in the wind-up in stage three, when Michael Matheson said, and I quote, the Information Commissioner of Canada said only last year, so this is 2001, that it has taken some 10 to 15 years to start to break down the culture of secrecy that exists in many of Canada's public services. I believe that such culture is probably more deep-rooted in Scotland. Well, indeed it is. 15 years on, we see what's happening. It's time it changed. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Richard Leonard, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and also I'd like to thank Neil Finlay for securing this important members' debate. It's always interesting to be sharing a platform with Mr Finlay, even if it rarely happens, and even more rare that we agree, but in this situation we do. The Freedom of Information Laws and Procedures in Scotland, such as the Freedom of Information Act and the Environmental Regulations, were introduced to improve government and set strong standards. And it's disappointing that we hear from journalists across the political spectrum the serious concerns they have about in which the way the legislation is being interpreted and implemented by this government. We've heard about the concerns reg regarding information requests which are delayed beyond the 20-day working deadline, emails requesting updates of cases being routinely ignored, officials delaying responses for so long that initial requests were only answered under internal review, and Scottish government officials taking control of, of requests to other government agencies without the consent of applications. I could go on. Within the open letter, the journalists explained that their experiences raised concern on whether information requested by journalists are being treated and managed differently. And I have to say this, that as a member of this parliament, I find when I raise questions that it is usually met by a barrage of smokescreen, mirrors, diffusion, and in some cases, complaints to the standards commissioner, which have all been ignored and rejected. So I find that the journalists, and I have huge sympathy with them, uh, that they are being treated differently, but so are members of this parliament. Delays of withholding information is just not acceptable. And it's no surprise to me that the former Scottish Information Commissioner, Rosemary Agnew, has ordered ministers to improve their performance. A parliamentarians, surely we have questions and ask ourselves, does this SNP-led Scottish government have a transparency problem or just a code of secrecy? I believe, frankly, it does, and it must now take responsibilities for its actions and address the concerns with address within the open letter. Now, only last week, my colleague Jamie Green also pressed the Scottish Government on this matter during topical questions. He asked the Scottish Government what action it takes to comply with freedom of information requests. And instead of being given a direct answer, God forbid, the Minister provided a long list of statistics. In fact, Joe Fitzpatrick argued that the number of FOI requests had spiked dramatically as they had received more, more requests in 2017 than they had in the whole of 2007. Probably because that is the level of secrecy and the only way that people feel that they can get information. He also stated that in recent years that their performance is consistently better than that was achieved, the 61% that was achieved under the last full year of the previous administration. Well, not really. It's failing. They're failing to answer the requests, and it's not surprising that the members of this government look uncomfortable in their benches. I believe that moving forward, 
the Scottish Government must accept responsibility and take action on the serious concerns it's raised. It's unacceptable that they use the legislation to undermine openness and accountability. It simply cannot continue in a mature democracy. And I'd like to urge my speech today to urge the Government to admit its failings, request a review, and then get on with the day job, which is answering the questions and dealing with the problems in Scotland. Thank you. The last speaker in the open debate is Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I be begin as well by thanking Neil Findlay for submitting this motion and securing time for this important debate into the way the Scottish Government is dealing with requests under the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002. Uh, the very virtues of openness which lie at the heart of this legislation have been exchanged in practice for vices of secrecy. So that what we are witnessing are conscious and deliberate acts of political concealment and supported tonight by the total silence of SNP MSPs. And so I say to the Scottish Government and to those members, it's no good talking of freedom of information and open and accessible government. It is no good the government saying that it adheres to the principles of freedom of information legislation if its actions prove otherwise. Clearly, it is Parliament's job to scrutinise and to hold to account the government, and it is the government's job to defend its record. But what we are facing is a government whose first instinct, whose first instinct is to tell members of this Parliament as little as possible. And it is this first instinct which journalists are also objecting to. Straightforward parliamentary questions are met with evasion, a lack of detail, members being sent off on wild goose chases or being forced to submit FOI requests. Just last month, I asked the government a legitimate constituency question. I asked what consideration it had given in the last five years to take in the operations of the Grangemouth oil refinery into public ownership. And the answer I got from the energy minister was that there were 20 billion barrels of oil in the North Sea supporting 125,000 jobs in Scotland and that the government was supportive of investment which is consistent with its economic strategy. No direct answer to a straightforward and legitimate direct question in the public interest. Any administration committed to open and transparent government and at ease with itself would routinely publish agendas and minutes of meetings as a matter of course with any information that should not be in the public domain for whatever reason, redacted, and the reason for the redaction published, again, as a matter of course. Now, we may not expect official report standard records of government internal and external meetings, like those with outside commercial interests. We would simply expect minutes, in the words of Dick Crossman, minutes impersonal, dry, flat and precise but it is entirely right for the accountability of the Executive to Parliament and so to the people that we have access to sufficient information so that the people can form and make reasoned judgments. So that it is wrong that we now have a situation where ministers are holding meetings with civil servants present where no minutes are being taken. You cannot govern properly and democratically by unminited fireside chats in the gentlemen's clubs of Edinburgh. If we want to lead the way, if we want to be open and transparent, the Scottish Government must cease the practice of ministers holding meetings at which there are no notes and no minutes, because it stands in conclusion that tonight has revealed we have the Scottish Government, the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretaries, and now SNP backbench MPs on one side, and the Sovereign Parliament, the press, and the people on the other. I ask the SNP government in all sincerity, is that where you want to be? Or is it time for you to square your conscience and your conduct with your words? I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to respond to this debate. Uh, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate and thank Neil Finlay for bringing it to the Chamber. It allows me to address some of the points in the motion and highlight the Government's achievements in its effort to build a culture of openness and transparency across Scotland. I think most of the um, points um, which have been raised in the Chamber 
I have already covered in, in my, my speech. However, there was the, in the point that Monica Lennon and Andrew Whiteman made about um, this, uh, disclosure logs is not one that I was intending on covering. Um, I don't think we've taken anything off the website, so I don't think we've removed any information. Um, but it's, and, and I know that it's not something that is a statutory requirement, but it is something that I will take away and, and look at because I, I could see the, the advantages of, 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 of that. So it's something I'll, I'll go and look at. It wasn't something I had in my, my notes to cover, so I, I, will, I will look at that. But I, I think as a country, we can be proud of our record on freedom of information. In her special report published in April, the former uh, Scottish Information Commissioner stated that since the introduction of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002, Scotland has put itself ahead of the international field. And our public records... Yep. Tavish Scott. I'm grateful. The Minister mentions the previous... Uh, Commissioner in his remarks just now. Why did the previous uh, Commissioner describe the Government Ministers as rude? Joe Fitzpatrick. So I, I will come on to some of the, 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 the circumstances around the Information Commissioner's intervention and that, and that will be covered um, later. So, um, so that, that's where we are in terms of the international field. Our public records legislation demands the highest um, standards of um, authorities in response to record management. And internationally, the Open Government Partnership has recognised our commitment to openness, transparency as citizens' participation. Um, but I, of course, recognise that our performance in terms of responding to freedom of information requests on time is not good enough. And I can assure members that we, engage, we are engaging with the Office of the Scottish Information Commissioner to meet the high standards that are quite rightly expected of us. But probably to, to cover some of the points that... Um, yep. Neil Finlay. The, uh, the Commissioner's report um, said that on failure to respond, uh, the Commissioner received 10 failure to respond appeals, but Ministers reported there were none. How did that happen? Joe Fitzpatrick. So, um, I, would, I would need to look at the specifics of the numbers. Um, but over the, over the years, I want to talk a bit about why we've, we've perhaps not performing quite as well as we would hope to, to um, perform. And, and I hope that colleagues um, recognise my acknowledgement that we are not where we want to be. But over, over the years, the volume request has increased substantially. So we've now um, over 2,000 information requests being asked annually, being received annually. And even so, we're managing to respond to 1,674 responses in 2015, 1,557 in 2016. Um, so those figures compare to only 684 responses which were issued on time in the last full year of the previous administration in 2006. And in recent months, there has been a significant spike of, of requests to the Scottish Government. And as um, Mr Mountain said, by April of this year, we had received more um, uh, requests in 2017 than we had received in the whole of 2007. With the best will in the world, um, this will inevitably put strain on resources. But in spite of that increase in workload, in spite of that increase in workload, 76% of responses um, were issued in time in 2016, which compares favourably to the 61% achieved under the last full year of the previous administration. So more, more, more requests and more uh, responded on time. So just to, to clarify, performance is better, but I recognise it is not good enough, and that is why, as I've said, we are working to improve it. Neil Finlay. Thank you. Does the Minister not understand that if you ask, answer parliamentary questions properly, the numbers of FOIs will go down. The reason it's spiking is because we get absolute dross back in parliamentary answers. Joe Fitzpatrick. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I'm um, a bit short of time, actually. So, turning to the policy framework, our aim as a government is to keep our FOI legislation up to date to ensure it operates effectively for both applicants and public authorities. So, the latest... Um, Major addition, the 2013 Amendment Act improved and strengthened the legislation. It paved the way for the lifespan of key exemptions to be reduced from 30 years to 15 years, the shortest in the UK, giving journalists in Scotland access to information such as cabinet minutes, minutes much earlier than their London-based counterparts. This government has also extended the coverage of the Act to numerous organisations delivering public services, including local authority arms-length trusts and private prisons. 
um, a power which was never used by the previous administration. And the 2013 Act also ensures that new public bodies, such as the Scottish Fiscal Commission, um, are covered subject to FOISA from day one. I want to quickly talk about the comparison between the legislation here in Scotland and the legislation in the UK. And there's a wide recognition that our legislation is much stronger. For instance, the UK Act contains far more wide-ranging veto powers than our Act, powers that have never been used here but have been repeatedly used by the Westminster Government. And I, I, I guess a prime example, very relevant to this Parliament, would be the, 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 the fact that the, the minutes of the Cabinet Subcommittee on Devolution prior to setting up this, of this Parliament were withheld on the basis of that veto. Tavish Scott. Very grateful. Would the Minister not want to address the six separate points in the letter rather than talking about Westminster? Please. Joe Fitzpatrick. I will come to the, the point of, of, of the letter. But today's motion also uh, refers to the cost limit of £600, which is, I think, one of, one, of the, one of the points in the letter. And I think it's important to point out that, that the, while the £600 has remained the same, as has the £15 per hour, has also remained unchanged over that, that time. So that means that the cost limit has much the same effect now as it did back in 2005, i.e. a request can be refused only if it requires more than 40 hours' work. Um, and again, the Scottish legislation here compares very favourably favorably to the UK, where, although the cost limit is also £600, it's calculated at £25 an hour. So the UK government routinely... Um, I don't think I have time, sorry. The UK government routinely... Um, reject a, a request on cost after only 24-hour work. So there's a major difference in terms of the workload that is, is um, required prior to the cost cap being used. Um, finally, in I, I really think I'm going to have to, I'm over my time and I have some other points. To, and Mr. Mr Scott made the point about continuing covering some of the points from the, the, the journalists, which I do want to, to cover. So Finally, in terms of comparison between Scottish FOI practice and, and the UK, uh, and this is important because this is about getting information at all, the, the stats for the UK uh, published by the Cabinet Office show that uh, it responds to only 63% of requests uh, where it holds re relevant information, which compares to 85% here in Scotland. One of the important things that I, I think that we're doing, which I hope will help journalists going forward, is in terms of proactive release. So we're committed to proactively publishing um, information wherever possible, which means that, that members of, of the journalists and members of this parliament and members of the public can access that information without even asking for an FOI. So um, whether that's engagements, travel and gifts, there's a whole raft of government spending that's all automatically available and proactively released. And, and that is very important as part of our open data strategy, which helps ensure that Scotland meets internationally high standards of publication. Turning directly to the journalist's letter, I, of course, note the concerns that the, the, the journalists who are referred to in the motion raised. Journalists exercise a central role in an open and accountable democracy. All information requests are handled in accordance with our guidance, which is in the public domain. And obviously, if journalists are dissatisfied with any aspect of requests then, or review handling, uh, like any other requester, there's a clear route of appeal to the Scottish Information Commissioner. And the Scottish Information Commissioner's intervention concerning our performance in terms of timeliness demonstrates the strength of our legislation in this respect. But I think to respond to Andy Whiteman's point about... Um, Obviously, the letter actually went to the, the members of the committee rather than the government directly, but I um, have, um, we'd obviously rather address those concerns without the need for anyone's intervention. And my office have contacted Paul Holleran of the N NUJ to that end, and because I really don't want to be here having to defend um, um, the, the fact that the Information Commissioner said that our timeliness was, was not good enough. And, and as I've said before, we are working on that, but um, I will um, engage with the NUGA to try and understand their, their particular concerns, because as I said, um, the, the role that they play in a democracy is important, and, and I, I need to, to um, recognise that. must bring your remarks to a close, Minister. Um, the, the motion also referred to, uh, and, and the journal's letter to mentioning and recording of, of ministerial meetings, and I, I, again, I can assure uh, members that the Scottish Government fully complies with all record management practices, policies, including those set in the ministerial code. The code is clear that formal meetings should be recorded, setting out the reasons for the meeting, the names of those attending, and the interests represented. represented. 
on a, a monthly list of engagements carried out by ministers. It's already proactively published, something which never happened before. So people did not know the, um, what was there. Moving very quickly, presiding officer, um, and, uh, yesterday I signed the first commencement order of Scotland's Lobbying Scotland Act, paving the way for the preparation for the lobbying register to go live in January. And I, th I think that's very important in terms of that information. The purpose of the act is to increase public transparency by establishing a register to contain details relating to lobbying by paid consultants and in-house lobbyists with ministers and members. And I think particularly now, um, all, a lot of that data is already in the public you, domain you in relation must to bring ministers, your remarks to close, but Minister. given we have a parliament of, of uh, minorities, uh, I think it's important for that tra that transparency is extended to other members of the, the parliament. I, I was, had hoped to talk about open government partnership, where uh, we are continuing to try to, to strive. Our aim, our aim is to use these tools to um, try to increase public participation, um, I must insist, Minister, we're out of time. And, and, and move towards the, the aim of an open and accessible government um, through our legislation, best practice, practice, and our wider civil engagement will continue to drive that ambition to be a more open and more transparent government. Thank you. Mr. Bates, can... <clears throat> point of order, Edward Mount. Presiding officer, I mean, one of the problems that we've had tonight is, is the fact that, yet again, no answers have been given to the questions. Surely the point of asking questions is to get answers. And if we got specific answers to freedom of information requests, surely the minister would accept that there wouldn't be quite so many. That wasn't a point of order, Mr Mountain. That's a matter for the ministerial code. And I would suggest that you would write to the government once you have looked again at what was said in the debate. I close this meeting. <laughs>